Um, my name is Joan Newth, and I'm in the Religious Studies Department here at John Carroll, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you once again Kelly Spurl, Dr. Kelly Spurl from St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire, where she is the Associate Professor of Theology. Um, her lectures have been focusing on women from the early modern period up until the present day. Um, and the title of this series is Catholic Women Encountering Religious Pluralism. So far, we've heard about an English woman from the 17th century, Mary Ward, um, a French woman from the 17th century, Marie de l'Incarnation, who became a missionary to Canada, and last week, Elizabeth Lesseur, another woman from France um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Tonight, we are going to uh, be introduced to the daughter of Nathaniel Hawthorne, the great American writer, and his wife Sophie, Rose Hawthorne Lathrop, who made a journey from New England Unitarianism to uh, Catholicism, uh, where she ended up in New York City uh, as the foundress of a religious order of women. So, should be another interesting addition to our catalog of women. Kelly? Thank you so much, Joan. Welcome. So far we've looked, as Joan has recounted, so far we've looked at in these two e-lectures, Women in Reformation England and Europe, Counter-Reformation Quebec, and Late 19th Century France. Oh. But I think it would be a shame to conclude these talks without looking at at least one American Catholic women, woman. And so today, as Joan told you, I propose to look at a woman with a most American pedigree, Rose Hawthorne Lathrop. She was the daughter of one of the quintessential American writers of the 19th century, Nathaniel Hawthorne. She was raised in a background steeped in the most American expressions of Protestantism, Calvinism, Unitarianism, and Transcendentalism. She herself, like her father, had an ambivalent relationship to all these religious postures and drifted dissatisfied from one to another throughout her childhood and adulthood. On the cusp of middle age, Rose Hawthorne converted to Catholicism with the assistance of the Paulist Fathers, members of an American religious order of priests, itself founded by a convert from the same Unitarian and Transcendentalist background from which Rose came. Rose Hawthorne eventually became the founder of a religious order for women in the Dominican family, devoted to nursing indigent sufferers of cancer. To support her ministry, she drew upon the support of benefactors of all faiths and resolutely offered care to persons of all faiths and no faith earning her accolades from other American literary luminaries such as Mark Twain, otherwise known as Samuel Clemens, who in one letter said, quote, I have known about this lofty work of yours since long ago, indeed from the day you began it. I have known of its steady growth and progress step by step to its present generous development an assured position among those benefactions to which the reverent homage of all creeds and colors is due, unquote. Rose Hawthorne has a fascinating and edifying life that deserves to be better known, and for this reason I've chosen to speak to you today about her. Rose Hawthorne was born in 1851, the third and youngest child of Nathaniel Hawthorne and his wife Sophia Peabody Hawthorne. She was born at the high tide of her father's literary success, one year after the publication of his famous novel, The Scarlet Letter. As you may know from the setting of Hawthorne's most famous novel, Hawthorne was descended from Puritan stock in New England. His ancestors were Calvinist Congregationalists, whose theological outlook was dominated by belief in a stern God who predestined most of the human race to damnation and in the pervasive human depravity that rendered any effort to challenge that predestination to hell impossible. Hawthorne's writing suggests that he rejected this theology, though it remained influential in his fiction. 
He was therefore more receptive to the Unitarianism of his wife, Sophia. In early 19th century New England, Unitarian, excuse me, Unitarianism emerged out of 18th century criticisms of the harsh theology of Calvinism. It stressed instead a loving God and a more positive evaluation of the human capacity to seek and do the good. This reevaluation of human nature then engendered in Unitarian circles calls for social reform in movements for causes such as abolition, temperance, and women's rights. Unitarianism in the 1830s then gave rise to transcendentalism, a more radical expression of these ideas that in addition to stressing the natural goodness of humanity and its freedom, asserted the spiritual unity of the world in a kind of pantheistic sense and the superiority of intuition over reason and experience in a way that drew transcendentalism close to European romantic thought. The best representatives of New England transcendentalism were arguably Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Nathaniel Hawthorne encountered both Unitarianism and Transcendentalism in his early years in Salem, Massachusetts. Before his marriage to Sophia Peabody in 1842, Hawthorne in fact lived for a period of months in a, at a commune, Brook Farm, pictured here, populated by various figures with Unitarian and Transcendentalist sympathies. Among these were George Ripley, Orestes Brownson, and Isaac Hecker, all of whom would eventually convert to Catholicism, Isaac Hecker to found the religious order whose members were instrumental in Rose Hawthorne's conversion. We heard about Isaac Hecker in my last lecture on Elizabeth Lesseur as one of the causes of the Americanist controversy in late 19th century France. The biographical evidence suggests that, again, Hawthorne remained religiously ambivalent his whole life, and therefore his children received their religious formation predominantly from their mother, Sophia. This formation, however, was not rigidly sectarian. The transcendentalists were interested in Eastern religions, and Sophia alludes favorably to the Bhagavad Gita in one of her letters to the teenage Rose. She also recommended the daily reading of the pre-Reformation Catholic classic, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. In the course of her children's upbringing, Sophia took them to Anglican churches during sojourns in England and Roman Catholic churches during a stay in Rome, where the art, music, and elaborate liturgies in these places enthralled the young rose. Otherwise, perhaps reflecting her father's religious ambivalence, what evidence that survives of Rose's youth suggests that she had little taste for either Unitarian or Anglican worship. She seems to complain about going to church all the time. Rose's, Rose Hawthorne's childhood was almost completely itinerant, and the pattern continued well into her adulthood. She lived in Salem and Concord, Massachusetts, various places in England, Rome, and other places on the European continent. A good deal of this itineracy was due to the family's financial insolvency. Despite the enormous success of works like The Scarlet Letter, and partly because of imperfect copyright laws at the time, laws actually that Rose's future husband will help to, res uh, will help to address, Nathaniel Hawthorne did not make a lot of money during his lifetime. Having lost his father at age four, he had no resources from his family of origin, and thus when he married, his family lived mostly in genteel poverty, constantly on the move in search of cheaper housing and a lower cost of living. Nathaniel Hawthorne died in my home state of New Hampshire in the year 1864. Four years after his death, Sophia and the children returned to Europe. It was during a sojourn in Dresden, Germany, that Rose met George Lathrop an aspiring lawyer who later became a writer. Only seven months after her mother Sophia died in London in 1871, Rose married him against the wishes of her remaining family. Like Rose, George was an American in Europe, 
but without Rose's Puritan Unitarian religious background. He was Episcopalian, and so the couple married at St. Luke's Anglican Church in the Chelsea section of London. Shortly thereafter, Rose and her husband returned to the States, where both attempted to embark upon literary careers, George with somewhat more success than Rose. Now I have to admit, I always think it's better for children of famous artists to pursue another line of work than that of their famous parent. For Rose, it might have been better for her to pursue the profession of her maternal grandfather, for example. Say, become a dentist, or at least a dental assistant. Nathaniel Hawthorne was one of the giants of 19th century American literature. It was always going to be difficult to live up to his example, as Rose, her husband, George, her husband George, and her brother Julian were all to find. To be honest, Rose Hawthorne was not an enormously talented writer, as far as I can determine. Her fictional works and poetry were generally conventional and sentimental. The writing she later engaged in as a religious in support of her ministry was full of passion, leavened by occasional flashes of wit and pithiness, but also frequently turgid and verbose. She was probably never destined to win great recognition as a writer. Nevertheless, she and George made every effort to pursue literary careers while living in various homes in New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. They had one child, pictured here, a son named Francis Hawthorne Lathrop, born in 1876. Interestingly, or sort of sadly, uh, after the birth of her son, Rose suffered from postpartum depression, serious enough to require her hospitalization in a mental asylum for a period of months. And as you can see from his dates, tragically, the son died in 1881 at the age of five of diphtheria. This loss, combined with financial precarity and strained relations with Rose's family, who frequently fought over the, the management of Nathaniel Hawthorne's literary legacy, contributed to difficulties in the marriage between Rose and her husband, George. These triggered a separation between the two for some months between 1883 and 1884. However, the couple reconciled and the marriage continued for another 10 years or more. Under the guidance of a Paulist priest, Rose and George both converted to Catholicism in March of 1891, an event that caused much comment, both positive and negative, in Catholic and Protestant news outlets at the time. Again, Rose's ancestral links with America's Puritan past were probably the reason why the media took such an interest in this otherwise private decision. Prior to this time, the couple does not seem to have attended any church consistently, though Rose is reported to have taught Sunday school at a Unitarian church in Concord, Massachusetts, around the time of her son's death. Interestingly, when she was confirmed as part of her rep reception into the church, Rose took the name of Hildegard of Bingen, the 12th century Benedictine abbess who was both a prolific writer and musician. After their conversion, Rose and George became involved in numerous Catholic projects. They participated in a Catholic summer school scheme that the Paulists sponsored. They researched and composed a history of the Visitation Convent in Georgetown, Washington, D.C., and they made presentations at the Catholic Columbian Congress in Chicago in 1893, which was held in conjunction with the World's Columbian Exhibition. You may remember that it was also in conjunction with this exhibition that the first World's Parliament of Religions was held, which I mentioned in my last talk about Elizabeth Lesueur. At this Catholic Congress, Rose gave an impassioned plea for women's rights in her address, reflecting the outlook of the emerging feminist and suffrage movements of the 19th century. The book project on the Visitation Convent is noteworthy too. Not only was it about a religious community, something Rose seems to have become increasingly interested in during this period, but it was about a community founded by a woman, St. Jane de Chantal, 
who, like Rose, had been a wife and mother before taking up a religious vocation. Whether composing this history was a direct catalyst for her later decisions is unclear, but it is a fact that a year after its publication, a year after the publication of this study about the Visitation Convent in Georgetown, in 1895, Rose separated from her husband permanently, apparently with the intent of pursuing some kind of religious life and ministry. The reasons for the final breakup of the marriage are fundamentally unknown. I've noted a number of strains that told on the couple from its earliest years, the disapproval of Rose's family, financial difficulty, the challenges of what tried to be a two-career marriage, the loss of a child. Past biographers have attributed the final demise of the marriage to George Lathrop's alcoholism. Yet the most recent academic biographer of Rose Hawthorne has discounted that claim as based on insufficient evidence. We should probably attribute the end of the Lathrop's marriage to multiple causes rooted in the contingencies of the couple's temperaments and history. It is probably correct, however, to identify the immediate impetus for Rose's initiation of the separation as her identification, after nearly 45 years at that point, of her true vocation in life. She wanted to take up social service, offering nursing care to the poor of New York City. How did she decide upon this course of action after decades of trying to pursue literary success? Biographers report that sometime after her conversion in 1891, the Polis priest who had supervised her reception into the church, Father Alfred Young, told Rose the story of a poor seamstress without family or fortune in the city who had fallen ill with cancer. This was at the time a singular misfortune. The late 19th century, with the discoveries of Louis Pasteur and other scientists, saw the rise of public awareness of the cause of infectious diseases in microscopic bacteria and viruses. Tuberculosis was the disease most associated with this awareness. But many thought erroneously that cancer too was caused by contagious microbes, and so victims were often ostracized by family, friends, and neighbors who feared infection. In the wake of her diagnosis, Father Young told Rose, the poor seamstress had been evicted from her residence and eventually sent to Blackwell's Island off Manhattan, where she was quarantined but given wholly inadequate care until she died lonely and in pain. Here we have a picture of Blackwell's Island from 1853. This is a photograph of the same location from probably later in the 19th century. Hearing the story about the poor seamstress triggered Rose's growing conviction that something needed to be done to address the desperate plight of persons in similar situations. Rose seems to have had some kind of nursing ministry in mind already in 1895 when she separated from her husband for the last time. In the months that followed, she spent time in Montreal, Canada with the gray nuns who ran the general hospital in the city. And like the Visitation Sisters in Georgetown, were founded in the 18th century by another woman who had been a wife and mother before taking up a religious vocation, namely Saint Marguerite Duville. Rose also spent time in this period, after the separation from her husband, on retreat in Wellesley, Massachusetts with the Sisters of Charity, founded by Saint Vincent de Paul and Louise de Marillac in Paris in 1633. In 1896, Rose studied nursing for a period of months at the New York Memorial Hospital, and in September of that year, took up residence in a small tenement apartment on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and began her work. Early on, Rose split her time between seeing patients in a walk-in clinic on her premises in which she changed dressings and dispensed medicine and other necessities, and making house calls to provide similar treatment to those who could not leave home. Here we have a picture of her dressing, changing somebody's dressing uh, in this early period. Eventually, Rose offered permanent residence within her apartment 
to those suffering terminal cancer. A number of principles underlined, underlined Rose, Rose's ministry from its earliest days and later as it expanded in size and geographical scope. She provided all care free of charge and to anyone who needed it, regardless of ethnicity or confessional status. She supported her work only through private donations and refused to take a salary for her services. In this respect, she saw her work as different from that of the welfare professionals who had started to emerge in the settlement movement of the 19th century. Once she started accepting live-in patients, Rose sought to provide a home-like atmosphere to counter the inadequacies of the medical institutions of the time. Friendliness, aesthetics, and comfort were essential to Rose's residences, and to the latter end, she had no qualms about allowing patients to smoke, to enjoy the occasional glass of sherry, and to have adequate pain relief through drugs when necessary. She abhorred the fact that in the hospitals of the time, doctors often subjected patients to medical experimentation and refused to allow it in her homes. Cleanliness and hygiene, too, were essential in her homes, since Rose sensitively understood that the embarrassment caused by the odor, as well as the disfigurement of cancerous lesions, added to the misery of the disease for, the, for its victims. In addition, Rose was convinced that proper hygiene practiced by nurses and patients would reveal that cancer was not contagious. Rose pressed on by herself with what quickly became an exhausting ministry. This must be the context in which she describes herself in the strange, not entirely benign phrase that I gave as a title to this talk. She called herself a machine for expressing love. Certainly the phrase conveys her motivation for her ministry, the Christian virtue of charity, but it also captures something of the mind and body numbing challenges of Rose's demanding vocation. Fortunately, in, Dece in December of 1897, Rose was joined by a helper named Alice Huber. Alice was a young Catholic woman from Kentucky who, like Rose, had artistic inclinations. I believe she was a visual artist, but was also in search of some deeper service to God. Rose seems to have begun her work in 1896 with the hope that it might attract other women and lead to the formation of a religious community. However, she was impeded in promoting that development early on by the fact that under canon law, she was still a married woman, though she had received ecclesiastical sanction for her separation for, from her husband. Hence, it was only after George Lathrop died from kidney disease in April 1898 that Rose initiated the process of seeking formal ecclesiastical recognition of her religious life and ministry. The Archbishop of New York initially rebuffed her attempts, but in September 1899, Rose and Alice were allowed to establish themselves as a chapter of the lay third order of St. Dominic. Rose became Sister Mary Alfonso. Alice became Sister Mary Rose. In 1900, then, Rose and Alice took vows as full-fledged vowed Dominican sisters. And in 1901, their small community, which included one other woman by then, was incorporated in the state of New York as the Servants of Relief for Incurable Cancer. They now go by the name of the Dominican Sisters of Hawthorne. Prior to this, in the spring of 1899, Rose and Alice had acquired their first permanent building for the ministry at 426 Cherry Street on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which they called, again telegraphing some of the key features of Rose's ministry, the St. Rose Free Home for Incurable Cancer. The home was named for St. Rose of Lima, Peru, an ascetic in the Dominican family who died in 1617 and who at the time the home was established was the only female saint of the Americas. Not long after their incorporation in the summer of 1901, the servants opened another home, 
one that could accommodate male as well as female patients, on the site of a former Dominican monastery that itself had taken over an old hotel in northern Westchester County, which is just north of New York City. The site was called Rosary Hill, and here we have a picture of the original building. It was located in a development called Sherman Park, served by a post office called Neperin, and the nearest railroad stop was called Unionville. As Rose Riley put it, the identification of the home's exact location in its early months was a Chinese puzzle. Later, the municipality was renamed Hawthorne in honor of its illustrious resident. Eventually, the old hotel was replaced in the 1920s by a, a fireproof, because some of these patients are smoking, and quite lovely Spanish colonial building, which you can visit today, and the sisters, in fact, are quite eager to have you visit. I've visited myself. It's very beautiful, again, classic uh, Spanish colonial building from the early 20s, to which a very uh, harmonious modern addition has been uh, built on. And you can see the graves of Rose Hawthorne, Lathrop, and Alice Huber on the grounds of uh, this site. From 1901 to 1904, putting her previous literary experience to the service of her ministry, Mother Alfonso almost single-handedly wrote and published a small periodical called Christ's Poor to publicize her ministry and encourage donations to it. She also wrote numerous articles for newspapers about her work and one book of memoirs, The Memories of Hawthorne, the proceeds from which she used to finance her ministry, both when it was originally published in 1897 and when it was reissued in 1923. But these literary endeavors aside, once she embarked upon her service to the cancerous poor in the fall of 1896, Rose Hawthorne's restless, itinerant lifestyle came to an end. She moved to Rosary Hill when it opened in 1901 and never left until she died peacefully in her sleep from heart failure on July 8, 1926. In 2003, Edward Cardinal Egan, the now retiring Archbishop of New York, authorized the opening of the process for Rose Hawthorne's canonization which is currently ongoing. Rose, I think, Rose Hawthorne led a remarkable life. It's a very American life because it embodies not only the opportunity to pursue a long spiritual search in a religiously diverse society that allows freedom of religion, but also a practical, can-do attitude that many see as one of the best features of the American character. The religious context of America itself in the late 19th and early 20th centuries shaped the eventual outcome of Rose Hawthorne's spiritual journey in various ways, and I would like to consider some of those influences for a moment. As it was for her father, the influence of Puritan Calvinism on Rose seems to have been mostly negative though Rose's search in later life for some activity by which she could be useful and do her duty by her fellow human beings surely would have, ha have found some resonance with some still in the Congregationalist fold. Even more harmony is evident between Rose's Catholicism and the Unitarian and Transcendentalist convictions to which her mother Sophia introduced her in childhood and youth. Again, these outgrowths of New England congregationalism rejected the Calvinist doctrine of total human depravity and expressed a confidence that human beings had gifts that remained intact despite sin, which could be used to benefit society. And again, as I said earlier, from this came the impulse to social reform in these traditions, with which Rose's own ministry among the poor and marginalized is clearly continuous. Rose may well have learned the Thomistic doctrine of grace building on nature in the catechesis that preceded her conversion in 1891. Again, Leo XIII's encyclical, Iterni Patris, recommending the study of Aquinas, was promulgated not long before in 1879. But this conviction was obviously compatible with the optimism of the Unitarian outlook of her mother, Sophia Peabody. 
Elsewhere in Rose's family, we may speculate that the example of her older sister, Una, was also influential. Una, like Rose, was imperfectly talented and unlucky in love, but found some direction in life after her mother's death, doing settlement work with orphans in England under the auspices of the Anglican Church. She, in fact, died while staying at an Anglican convent in the, in the year 1877, though it is not clear she had intentions of formally joining the community at the time of her death. When we turn to the specifically American Catholic influences on Rose's life and ministry, obviously, the Paulist fathers were terribly important in Rose's conversion to Catholicism. Now, as I noted last week, uh, and even earlier uh, in this talk, this was a society of priests founded by Isaac Hecker. As I reported last week in my talk on Elizabeth Lesur, Hecker was born in New York City uh, of German immigrant parents in the year 1819. He was raised Methodist, but in young adulthood joined the Transcendentalist movement and once belonged to the same Transcendentalist commune as Rose's father Nathaniel did, Brook Farm, before he converted to Catholicism in 1844. And actually, I haven't been able to quite determine whether Nathaniel Hawthorne was at Brook Farm at the same time as Isaac Hecker was. The most recent academic biographer of Hecker does not make note of this. In any case, following his conversion, Hecker joined the Redemptorist Order, which specialized in mission work, often among German-speaking immigrant communities. However, after some time in the order, Hecker conceived a desire to found an English-speaking branch of the order, specifically for the purposes of missionizing non-Catholics in the United States. His efforts to achieve this goal led to his departure from the Redemptorists, and actually, as I admitted last week, his expulsion, but it also led to his eventual founding with papal approval in the 1850s of what was formally called the Missionary Society of St. Paul, a.k.a. the Paulists. This order pursued the goal of Catholic evangelization in America through public addresses and mass media. Again, Rose Hawthorne and her husband were catechized and received into the church under Paulist instruction, cooperated with the Paulists in Catholic summer schools. George Lathrop's funeral was held in a Paulist church. As possibly with Elizabeth Lesueur, I think the example of Isaac Hecker and the Paulists, confident that Catholicism could make an important contribution in an American society whose religious diversity was protected by the constitutional separation of church and state, had an impact on Rose's vision of her own eventual ministry, which, as we will see, began in one of the most religiously diverse cities in the States at the time and self-consciously embraced that diversity. It is also possible that in publishing the small journal Christ's Poor to publicize her work, Rose was following the example of the Paulists, who saw print journalism as an effective means of evangelization. Whatever her literary limitations may have been, this small journal was helpful in publicizing Rose's ministry and soliciting financial support for it. With further regard to the Catholic influences on Rose, I also want to cite the significant role models she seems to have found in various women in the Catholic monastic and ascetic tradition, some of them from the context of the Americas. I was struck when I was researching this talk by how many female saints crop up in writings by and about Rose Hawthorne. Uh, again, you hear about Hildegard of Bingen and St. Jane de Chantal in the Dominican family, Catherine of Siena, and Rose of Lima. In particular, Rose seems to have drawn upon the living example of women in religious congregations resident in North America involved in the sort of active ministry she eventually took up. Here I'm thinking in particular, again, of the Grey Nuns of Montreal, again, founded by St. Margaret Duville in the 18th century, and the Sisters of Charity, founded in the 17th century by Louise de Marillac in, in collaboration with St. Vincent de Paul, but it should be remembered, 
established in the States by St. Elizabeth Seton in the 19th century. Remember I had said in my lecture on Marie de l'Incarnation some weeks ago that she inaugurated a long tradition of Catholic female religious in North America who built the social service and educational infrastructures of many communities. Rose Hawthorne and the Servants of Relief are continuous with and extend this tradition. Moreover, I think Rose saw in such figures not only inspiring role models, but also women who managed to overcome the limitations their societies placed upon their gender, and who thus, who thus represented the realization of the feminist ideals Rose would have inherited from such strains in her Unitarian background and about which she spoke at the Catholic Columbian Congress of Chicago in 1893. It should be noted that Rose's mother, Sophia, was one of a remarkable trio of sisters in the Peabody family of early 19th century New England. Sophia was a noted painter, sculptor, and journal writer. Her older sister, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, was an important figure in Unitarian and Transcendentalist circles in Boston. She ran a journal and a bookstore, which became the site of an influential literary salon. She was also a significant figure in the establishment of kindergarten education in the United States. Likewise, Mary Peabody Mann was a teacher who in eventually became a close collaborator of her husband, the 19th century educational reformer Horace Mann. The study of these women's lives, which writer Megan Marshall has recently chronicled in an excellent group biography called The Peabody Sisters, reveals that despite these women's notable talents, they suffered real financial hardship and social marginalization throughout their lives due to their gender and lack of access to higher education and professional advancement. I suspect that what Rose Hawthorne saw in Catholic religious women such as Hildegard of Bingen or Marguerite Duville was the possibility of overcoming the barriers that had stood in the way of the full realization of the abilities of her mother and aunts in American society. Her admiration for such figures thus comes out, I theorize, out of the intersection of her exposure to the Catholic doctrine of the communion of saints with late 19th century feminism. Yet we should note that Rose also looked to American female role models outside the Catholic tradition for inspiration for her work. She spoke admiringly in her writings of two early pioneers in the field of nursing. Florence Nightingale, who was raised Anglican, and Clara Barton, who came from a Universalist family in Massachusetts. And she speaks about them right alongside the 17th century Saint Vincent de Paul. Her notion of the communion of saints could thus be expansive and further could intersect with a good deal of homegrown American patriotism. In illustration of this, I cite the fact that in one issue of Christ's Poor, Rose Hawthorne included a prayer to one of the founding fathers, George Washington. I, I don't know about you, but I was not aware that the Catholic Church sanctioned an official cult to our first president, even though I'm sure he was a very good guy. Of course, Rose Hawthorne's ministry was itself significantly shaped by the specific sociological realities she encountered when she opened her first home in Lower Manhattan in 1896. I think the best way to imagine what Rose encountered when she rented her first tiny apartment is to make a visit to one of the best small museums in New York City, and take it from me, I'm a native, the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. This museum, located in an authentic mid-19th century tenement, has numerous apartments each of which is restored to a different period in the building's history. As you go through the floors, as in the different layers of sedimentary rock, you encounter writ large the ethnic and religious diversity of New York at the turn of the 20th century. 
You see Italian Catholic immigrants living above German Jewish immigrants living above Turkish Sephardic Jewish immigrants living above Irish Catholic immigrants. A graphic illustration of the melting pot that was New York at this time. But cancer crossed all ethnic and religious boundaries. And so to address the scourge, Rose Hawthorne was determined to minister to all regardless of creed or ethnicity and challenged anyone who got in her way of doing so. Rose became intimately familiar with anti-Semitism in that first tenement apartment. The neighbors on one floor called a Jewish woman on another that thing. Horrified by such blind prejudice, Rose befriended the woman and eventually reconciled her to the previously hostile neighbors. Interestingly, in the 1880s, Rose came to know quite well the poet Emma Lazarus, the author of the lines inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Emma Lazarus was a Jewish woman who, like Rose, had links with the Transcendentalist movement. She had a correspondence with Ralph Waldo Emerson until her death in 1887. She was also involved in settlement work with Jewish immigrants fle fleeing pogroms in Eastern Europe in the late 19th century. Rose speaks admiringly of her in her writings, and it is likely Emma Lazarus's own example of social service was influential on her. Unfortunately, Emma Lazarus died young of cancer herself, though she received excellent care to the end from her large, loving family. It was the lack of just such support that Rose wanted to address with her ministry. And again, Rose was determined that that ministry would be offered to all regardless of ethnicity or religious conviction. In fact, her first attested patient was a seven-year-old Jewish boy who appeared at her clinic to have a dressing changed. Over and over again in the pleas she published in Christ's Poor and other newspapers, Rose repeated that her services were available to all, regardless of color or creed. And reports from her homes put proof to these claims. In a report compiled around 1912, Rose enumerated that in the two New York homes, the one in the city and the one at Rosary Hill, she had cared for 652 Catholics, 363 Protestants, and 30 Hebrews. While her networks in New York probably guaranteed a higher number of Catholic patients in that location, the proportions were reversed in the home in Atlanta, Georgia, that was opened in a former Hebrew orphan's home in 1939 after Rose's death. A report for the year 1944 recorded that of the patients cared for, 540 were Protestant, 24 were Catholic, and 8 were Jewish. An admiring letter from a Monsignor published in the New York Herald Tribune early on in the servant's history uh, said of the order that when asked for care, quote, not once was there a question as to the religion or the color of the applicant, simply, is he incurable, is he poor, unquote. Not only did Rose seek to serve all regardless of ethnicity or religion, she was willing to accept help in her ministry from others of diverse religious backgrounds. One day a lawyer whose wife had died of cancer offered his services free to the servants and continued to do so for nearly 20 years, though he was not Catholic. Records exist of donations of money and volunteer assistance over the year from persons of all sorts of different religious backgrounds. The records speak of Baptists, Christian scientists, Jews. Rose even published in Christ's Poor one donation from an individual who only wanted to be identified by the sobriquet heretic. Moreover, Rose refused much needed donations if benefactors wanted them to go only to Christian patients. On the other hand, Rose was always clear that her Catholic Christian faith inspired and motivated her ministry. And while she had no problem arranging for the burial of some of her deceased patients in Protestant cemeteries, she was never going to deny the importance of her own religious convictions to her work. 
When told that a potential wealthy donor objected to the Catholic nature of her work, she tartly replied to Alice Huber, he can keep his old $10,000, thereby showing a little of what she called her porcupine nature when her principles were attacked. Her father, noting her stubborn and sometimes contrary nature as a child, had dubbed her pessima. In all of this, Rose Hawthorne represents the admirable respect for religious diversity that distinguishes American society at its best and that exists in the American Catholic tradition. What brought her to this place? Surely her own multifaceted religious journey, her extensive travels, her formation under the Paulists, and both her literary and ministerial activities in large metropolitan centers freed her from narrow sectarianism. But I think for Rose Hawthorne, it was the leveling experience of confronting the brutal realities of poverty and humiliating disease that convinced her of the fundamental equality of all, the fundamental dignity of all, and the fundamental duty of all to relieve suffering. A diary entry of 1896 reveals this in a passage in which she confesses, quote, my first thought in putting myself upon the same plane as with these people was that I was making a concession, one needed but still somewhat abnormal and self-abasing. My second thought was that there are no planes in persons, but only in circumstances, and that the circumstances which career above the, above the poor, the ignorant, the darkly corrupt, are a disgrace, unquote. A poor person might be ill-educated, dirty, even drunk or drug, ad drug ad addled and addicted, and she encountered all of this on the Lower East Side. Even so, they were still, as she put it, every inch a relative. So what you see in Rose Hawthorne's evolution is the movement from thinking of herself as part of a social elite, as indeed coming from American literary royalty, however impoverished she was, to seeing herself in complete solidarity with those who suffered, a solidarity that transcended ethnic, class, and religious boundaries. Ironically, I think it was this realization that enabled Rose Hawthorne to make psychic peace with the legacy of her famous father, a legacy I've suggested here was as much a burden as a source of pride for Rose and her siblings. More than once in her published writings, Rose cites a story from one of her father's essays about English poverty which he wrote while working in England as American consul in Liverpool from 1853 to 1857. In the story, and without identifying himself as the protagonist, Hawthorne describes inspecting a local almshouse and encountering a small child horribly disfigured by scurvy. Hawthorne describes how he reluctantly complied with the child's wish to be picked up and held his feelings a mix of revulsion and compassion. For a Catholic, of course, the story recalls St. Francis of Assisi's embrace of the leper. But it's clear from her remarks in Memories of Hawthorne that Hawthorne's experience of kissing the leper resonated deeply for Rose Hawthorne later in life. It was that experience that enabled her to see in her later life's work a worthy response to her father's insight on this occasion that, quote, we are responsible in our own degree for all the sufferings and misdemeanors of the world in which we live and are not entitled to look upon a particle of its dark calamity as if it were none of our concern. The offspring of a brother's iniquity being his own blood relation and the guilt likewise a burden on him unless he expiated it by better deeds." Unquote. Here we see a clear parallelism between Nathaniel Hawthorne's recognition that the impoverished child was his own blood relation and his convert daughter's conviction 
that however diseased and regardless of his or her religious persuasion, the impoverished victim of cancer was every inch a relative. In that recognition, Rose Hawthorne found peace and compensation for whatever feelings of inadequacy she may have felt throughout her life as the daughter of a famous American writer. Through it, too, she was able to make her own valuable contribution to American society and culture and to Christian witness in a religiously diverse environment. Thank you for your attention.